Yes, found the Denisel Waters here. Thought I'd just put my own picture there for a moment. We're still doing this journey of self awareness, this inner journey of self awareness. And the purpose is to become one's authentic self. I thought I'd mention that as we look at this, it's not that it's something new by any stretch of the imagination. It's centuries old. It's millennials old. The uh, oracle at Delphi, it is said that would ask the person that came, who are you? Who are you? It is said of the Sphinx that the Sphinx would ask those individuals who inquired about life, would ask what walks on four legs, walks on four when it's young, walks on two in the midst of life. And walks on three at the life's edge or life near life's end, and would allow the individual to contemplate that. All of those various versions of the same question: Who are you? Who are you? What is your identity? And self awareness finds answers to those types of questions. Today we speak of emotional intelligence and cultural competencies. And we're speaking of the same item differently, but it's still the same item. As a person I've done um, experiences as a minister. I've gone to school, of course, as a minister and had experiences of a minister. People might ask, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And they have in mind, well, did you get the experience first or did you get the training first? Well, my particular journey is that really I had a dream when I was maybe about 17, 18 years old. I had a second dream after I had been in the military. And uh, per having that dream, I then uh, spoke with my father about that dream, who took me to his brother. His brother was a minister. Um, uh, my father named Amos, Aronzimus, if you get the African name that he had, um, and his brother, which we call Uncle David, or David, and he was a minister, and when I related to him my dream, he then said, you have received a call from, for ministry, I did not know the meaning of what he said, nor did I ask the meaning at that time of what he had said um, in regard to that. But he related, or he, I found out that there were ministers in my family, and he let me know. And it was conducive, or it was in line with the dream that I had had the in this day and time, the year um, twenty nineteen still, uh, but a few um, uh, individuals recall that earlier there was this experience of um, really two movies um, as an African American, very proud of these movies, but there are a number of movies that have the same kind of theme, but the movie Black Panther uh, came out. Um, that particular movie, 
at a scene in which the uh, ancestors uh, showed up for T'Challa and they come and they appear in various ways. And that is very much uh, what my dream was about, my particular dream. In my particular dream, they appear, my ancestors appeared as giants uh, relatively to my size. I look to myself like they would they were giants, and I was small. I was like a pygmy when I came there. That's also very much like the experience of uh, the dragon in the movie Mulan. That's another place where I think about that. The dragon was played by or voiced by the person named Eddie Murphy, I believe it was, if I remember correctly. But he was standing with the, or wanted to stand, or be on the pedestal with the ancestors, and he wanted to live an honorable life or serve in the capacity honorably. And the ancestors were around him, or he was one of them. But my ancestors were standing around in a circle, and I was invited into the circle. And so I didn't initially go into the ministry. It took me a number of years uh, before I accepted the call, as we say, um, went to um, went on lived life, uh, got married, um, then also uh, individuals saw the call as I related to various individuals, did various tasks, and they encouraged me to go to school, and so that's what I did in regard to school and regarding school. While I was in school, while I was in school, a number of times, um, I was elected to office, and then a part of that office was that I had to stand up before crowds of individuals in a forum, and my responsibility was to what they call uh, receive the offering. And I developed a creative way to do that, and one of my professors who was known worldwide for what we call evangelistic meetings uh, heard what I did, saw what I did, and he came to me uh, later and, and spoke with me and encouraged me in my gift, if you will, wrote letters in my behalf and made sure that I received a call from what we called a conference and that was a call to work in a specific place. And that's what I did. I, I worked in that specific place. And while I was there, I've seen individuals who were scheduled to die according to the doctor, according to the hospital. And those individuals, I was asked to either visit them, pray for them, or whatever it may be. And their life was extended. Uh, one particular woman, her life was extended. Um, when I saw her in the hospital, she was expected to die within days. Uh, she, uh, when I went to see her, um, I prayed with her, and she um, got out of the hospital uh, later. Within maybe, let's say, about three, four days after I visited her, she stayed out of the hospital for 90 days or so. Um, but during that 90 days, she alerted her family to things they had not known about her. And she had grown adult children that did not know that she had resources, assets, funds, land, all kinds of things, almost like a new and different lifestyle. And she alerted them regarding those items. And then after that 90 days, um, she... Um, left extensive, extensive instructions to the family. And one of those instructions was that she would, when she died, that I was to do her eulogy. I was to do her eulogy. I did not know of this until it happened. And uh, she went back in the hospital after the 90 days. And when they called me to go to see her, she was not a member of the church that I served as pastor to. Uh, to. Um, but she left instructions that I was to do a eulogy. And when I went to see her um, and got in the room, finally got in the room, 
Uh, she had been dead four minutes. She had been dead four minutes. And I've had experiences, of course, when you're in a community as a spiritual leader, um, that people, uh, individuals who live right across from the church, that <laughs> pastored and served as pastor of uh, the individual said, I was their pastor. I did not know that, really. But, of course, I treated the individual um, with dignity, with respect, as all people deserve to be treated with respect. So a community uh, pastor as well. Um, in other places, individuals have come, and those individuals have said that they were advised by a doctor they would be dead within uh, six six uh, months, within six months. As a matter of fact, one of the individuals that I had on my last transmission um, you see the picture there of my standing beside an individual who is taller than I am. And that's one of the reasons I'm mentioning this. His name is Gene Owens. Uh, Mr. Gene Owens uh, was called Spider Owens. Um, he had been a, from, from what I understood, uh, he had been a, a sparring partner at one point in time with the great Muhammad Ali. This is a story that he told me, and he had a picture about that. Uh, I met Mr. Gene Owens in 1986, which is quite a while ago. Um, but at the time when I met him, uh, doctors had given him six months to live uh, because he had a type of cancer that was in the blood. And when he came, he asked that we would pray for him. And that's what we did. We prayed. We interceded. We affirmatively prayed. And uh, there um, as you can see, he's standing up. The year that we took that picture was 2018, I believe, that we took that picture. And Mr. Gene Owens still alive in 2019. I spoke with him uh, just a bit ago, um, maybe about a month, two months ago, spoke with Gene Owens. I don't live in the same area as he does, but I do remain in contact with Mr. Gene Owens. Um, and so... Um, he, he, he's still alive, still alive. It's one thing when you think, based on a doctor's prognosis, that you're going to pass away in a certain length of time. You've got a date certain for your demise. And Mr. Gene Owens had that. And when he came to me, um, and, and I was in the community, he was not directly tied to the church, coming to the church that I was in, but he was in a meeting and he asked for prayer and shared that with me. And then later in 2018, I believe it was, that when I saw him after an extensive time of not seeing him, God, because I moved out of that area, did not remain in contact with him, um, he uh, and his wife uh, lived in a particular location. And then he informed me that at that time, at that time when his life had been extended, he had what we call accepted Christ as his personal savior and that I was his minister. Uh, that's what he informed me of in regard to that. And so a very powerful statement, but he has lived decades beyond, decades beyond where the doctor had said and he had a date certain for his passing. Uh, at that time. So that's that's one of the things. Um, uh, the same thing happened in regard to a person who served as my barber. I have that on my Facebook page where his name is Saudi Shabazz. Uh, Saudi, Saudi Shabazz. Shabazz. Um, on my Facebook page, one of the Facebook pages, I think it is the Restore Executive Life and Leadership Coaching and Consulting, or maybe Spirit Victory of Praise. Um, uh, International Spiritual Center, uh, but we have it there where it talks about that um, uh, Saudi, who had been my barber uh, and has been my barber for about uh, 10 years now. Um, and there's a moment at which uh, Saudi is going through a process and he has a kind of throat cancer. And the doctors have said that he also has six months to live. And this is uh, in the year uh, 2014, I think it is, that we have this particular experience, go through this particular experience. 
And uh, it was at that time that uh, we prayed again. Uh, there's a there, there there's a whole experience that is involved with each one of these, and we go through a process of understanding what the doctors has said, have said, and the doctors have said, and then also uh, what the person feels when they hear that, and when they come, and when we speak to them, and talk with them about life, not about death, about life, not about death and talk with them about who they are and the meaning of their life. And so this, again, is very much a part of the um, inner journey of self-awareness to become one's authentic self. Uh, Many times it's at a point of crisis uh, that a person wakes up, as we call it, and begin to ask the questions, who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? It's at that time that those kinds of questions take place. Uh, It is often said that a person in perturbation or in a crisis with a, a disorienting event, that that person may find their purpose at that particular moment in time. That's why we're having this particular conversation. A person in the midst of a moment of perturbation, which is a moment where it seems things are being destroyed, that in the midst of that moment, there is purpose found in that moment. And again, this is depicted in the movie so many times. Uh, The classic Star Wars, of course, is where Luke Skywalker Uh, He says that he will not respond to the call that has been given to him to go with Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's going to stay with his aunt and his uncle or his uncle and his aunt and remain a farmer because he thinks that's what he was born to do. However, when he goes back to that farm, he finds that the empire has destroyed, killed, burned, his aunt, and his uncle. And it's then that he makes the determination that he's going to go with Obi-Wan Kenobi on a higher mission, if you will. It's depicted in Crisis that um, in the movie, as far back as The Wizard of Oz, that there is a storm that comes and it sweeps up Dorothy and takes her to the land uh, where she has to get back to her home. Well, the storm is really a psychological storm that is in her life. She has a situation that she's got to work out. There's a person who wants to take her dog from her. And that psychological storm is brewing in her mind. And she wants to resolve that particular issue, that particular problem that she has. And so these kinds of things are very much involved with this idea of this idea of self-awareness. Um, this is an amazing process. I want to mention uh, here that uh, also in this regard, uh, there when I speak of schooling, go to school, I also uh, go to school to become what they call a psychologist, industrial organizational psychology that sees organizations um, in industry as systems. Um, Speak of systems thinking, as it is called. And systems, there's a solar system, certainly you've heard of that. And there's a cellular system, you've heard of that. There are systems in the body, um, uh, the human body, if you will. And all of these systems are related and work in similar ways. And to understand one helps you to understand others. And so an organization has systems. There are different departments, like there are different organs within the body. And so all of these are related. And as a result of looking at these things, um, then you, be, you read a lot. You read a great deal. And reading leads to the aspect of an individual considering the commonalities about various things. And so 
there is an article that was written by a Dr. George Watts, uh, who was a Dr. George Watts and Associates. It's an article written by him. Um, it was written in 2012, and he writes, it was published in the Psychological Press, uh, the Psychologist Manager Journal, um, in 2012. Um, it is entitled, The Power of Introspection for Executive Development. The Power of Introspection for Executive Development. And he mentions this, uh, opens the article in this way. This article advocates that psychologists help coach senior executives through introducing the appreciation of introspection. Introspection is not a topic that is in vogue, but has a hundred-year history in psychology. He's going back to, of course, individuals like William James and others. So it has a hundred-year history in psychology. He does not say it has a hundred-year history, period. He says it has a hundred-year history in psychology. Psychology itself has very, but maybe about 100, 150 years. It's an early history to psychology becoming a science. So a hundred-year history in psychology. Helping executives understand and capture the power of introspection is based upon a cornerstone of leadership development. Let me read that again. Helping executives, we're talking about C-suite executives. I, 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 I say to individuals that I do executive coaching, executive coaching, and that's leadership coaching, leadership coaching. There are individuals who do develop, um, developmental coaching, that's leadership coaching, personal development, that kind of, there are performance coaches. Those individuals help people to perform better in the job that they have. But when we speak of leadership development, this is what this person is talking about. Helping executives understand and capture the power of introspection is based upon a cornerstone of leadership development objective. Accurate self-awareness leads to emotional maturity. Now, this is 2019, the end of 2019, December 2019. Let me read it again. Accurate self-awareness leads to emotional maturity. Maturity is an essential characteristic of C-suite executives reading still. With introspection, the majority of the effort is done solely by the executive him or herself with guided instruction from the psychologist coach. Psychologist slash coach. This makes the process low cost and convenience. Convenient. But two judgment is called for when a decision is 51 to 49. So it could go either way, if you will. Either way, 5149, you got to be mature if you're the person who is voting that additional one. You're that individual. You're the person that makes that decision as to which way it goes. If you vote one way, it's a 50 50 tie. If you vote the other way, it's 5149. If the executive is aware of his, her unconscious biases, it can positively tip the scale in favor of making the right call. This is so vital in regard to the moment that we're living in today. It applies on so many levels of the society. Consider this, and, and rarely do you want to take principles and just bring them into policies and practices for humans. What one, at least what I want to do so many times, 
is remain in the realm of the principles and allow the persons to bring it down to the policies and then bring it down to the practices for him or herself. But wherever you are, take this idea of mature judgment is called for when a decision is 5149. And think of organizations at all levels of society, in all parts of society, where it, it just seems like that that's the situation that we are in throughout the world, really, where there are uprisings that are taking place, where there seems to be almost a balancing of power, and we end up with pretty much a stalemate that occurs because individuals have these subconscious biases. They are already baked in before, before they actually look at anything. They are already decided before they see any evidence and no matter what evidence they see, those individuals are already going to vote one way or the other is what it says. You can read the article yourself. Is called the power of introspection for executive development. Executive, in some places, are filled with executives. Some places are filled with executives. And here you are, and it, when you talk about C suite, then you can have C suites of organizations, you can have C suites of uh, the governmental leaders, a whole group of individuals that are leaders of different places. They're governors, they are uh, the senators, they're congresspersons um, in the House of Representatives, all these kinds of places where unconscious biases are in place. And then we talk about the circle of influence, the circle of concern, all of these. Where's your locus of power? If the executive is aware of his or her unconscious biases, it can positively tip the scale in favor of making the right call. Through asking and reflecting on critical personal leadership questions, understanding the nature of positive introspection and removing the bias of the ego, Executives can grow in their own time and place. And so this is what is involved here. That leadership development has to do with an individual taking this inner journey. That's what is meant by introspection. So it's is looking inside and addressing really what are my subconscious, that which I'm not normally under so many circumstances and situations I'm not normally aware of. What are those unconscious biases? The individual, as we close out this particular section, the individual that uh, Carl Jung, a writer and psychologist, said, the cave we fear to enter becomes our destiny. And you, again, you see this in the movies where, again, in the movie Star Wars, you saw uh, Yoda, I believe it was, that was speaking to Luke Skywalker and encouraged him to enter the cave. It's the same idea, but it's dramatized there. It's the same item of self-awareness that is mentioned here that we've been talking about. Same idea. Go into your cave. You're in a journey. Think about who are you? We'll talk later. Blessings. Bye-bye.